Welcome into First Draft, the only show that believes that there actually was football played this past weekend because we were busy grinding the tape of Western Oregon and South Dakota State. I'm Field Yates, and the man that's been doing that for the past 40-plus years is, of course, Mel Kuyper Jr. And, Mel, the reason why we're watching this tape from all over the Missouri Valley Football Conference and places like that is because today is the show in which we highlight players that deserve more love because, as you tell me all the time, the draft does not end in round one. No, I think you look at day three is so important, so critical to what teams in terms of building their personnel and their talent base and their depth field. And that's what's going to happen here. Some guys that slide through the cracks, right? There's a deep position like wide receiver. Who gets lost in the shuffle a little bit? And who slides down maybe into that third, fourth, fifth round area and said, boy, he had second round ability. Maybe you know, at times in some games look like a first round caliber talent. Some of those guys are there. We're going to talk about them today. This is the part of the a year and the time of the year where I love to find those guys that are a little underrated, unheralded, that could be standouts in the National Football League. Yeah, and you are every single year finding more and more players who, for one reason or another, slide through the cracks. As you just referenced, we are here to help find a couple of those players, maybe give you a spotlight into those guys before the draft actually begins. A reminder you can find first draft on YouTube every Monday and Thursday or wherever you get your podcast. And thanks to those that are watching us here on TV. We've had a lot of fun being on the big screen. Mel, we are not just talking about guys that are completely off the grid. We are talking about some players that you probably have already heard of. They just deserve a bit more attention because there are a lot of names that certainly we are discussing right now. You're up first. Give me a wide receiver that, despite being a very, very deep wide receiver class, needs to be talked about a whole lot more. I'm going to go to a guy who was at Alabama. You think he's going into the SEC with the Crimson Tide, Nick Saban, and, boy, you're going to be hearing a lot about this guy. In the first couple of years at Alabama, what, nine catches, one touchdown, and he leaves. And we had a host of receivers leave Alabama, right? None of which you said that Nick Saban was saying at the time, well, I wish he was kind of one that got away. Mm. Wish we wouldn't have lost him. I mean, I wish he was still here. But there's one guy, Field, that I think if you ask Nick, that got away that I wish we would have had. It's Javon Baker at yeah. Central Florida at UCF. Javon Baker goes to UCF from Alabama. What does he do the first year? 56 catches, 14-yard average. That's a huge game against SMU, right? This is a guy 6'1 and a half, 208 pounds. He's got body control. He adjusts to the poorly thrown football. He's got length, vertical stretchability. It's a tracks that deep ball very well. This past year, though, Field, the improvement he showed in terms of big playability, he had 22 yard per catch average this year. 22 yard per catch average up from 14, as you see. He had a big game against Oklahoma. They, they, they forgot about him a couple of times. Just forgot about Javon Baker, and he made him pay. Had five catches, a couple touchdowns in that game. Huge game in their bowl game against Georgia Tech. Nine catches, 173 That's yards, right. and a touchdown. This is a kid that is smooth, he's athletic. He's got length of 6'1 and a half, nearly 210 pounds. And when he went to UCF from Alabama, he took off. Both years field, consistent in terms of reception. You see 52, 56. But I love to jump up in terms of making plays and getting down to field and, and making impact performances. Routine, basically. Game after game, he was impactful. Javon Baker, to me, is a guy, if he gets, like I say, lost in the shuffle with all these slot receivers, outside guys, all the talent we have at wide receiver, we can get to 25 receivers very easily field. Yeah. We think we like and can play in the National Football League. Somebody like Javon Baker may get into that mix and say, boy, how, how is he still there in the fourth, fifth round? If he gets down that far, I don't think he will. But if it happens, boy, he could be a steal. He'd be an unbelievable value. And I'm starting to wonder, you know, Mel, you're not a big technology guy, but I'm wondering if maybe you found a way to hack into my computer over the weekend to write down some notes because I'm sitting here looking at the things that I want to talk about with Javon Baker. Six foot one, three eighths of an inch. So six one, 210 pounds. The size, very good, obviously. You mentioned the big game production against the two teams that finished the season ranked this past year. You mentioned the Oklahoma game, Oklahoma State the other game. He had over 100 receiving yards in each of those games. He had three total touchdowns in those two games. He might not be allowed in the state of Oklahoma after what he did to those two teams this past season. <laughs> it was really good in some of the one-on-one -on -one stuff that we saw during the week at the Senior Bowl as well. Non- 
junky college football fans may recall Javon Baker because he was the one that blew a kiss to Brett Venables in that game against Oklahoma when he was racing down the sideline for an 80-plus yard touchdown. It feels like if you're looking for a red zone weapon who has got this unbelievable catch radius, Javon Baker is probably your guy. And to your point about all these great wide receivers, Mel, it just reinforces why next week when we go to the combine, it is such a critical week. Tiebreakers are taking place left and right. Who's a little bit stronger? Who's a little bit more explosive? Who's a little bit faster? That will tinker with our wide receiver board and lead us to have a much clearer picture of how these guys might stack up. I know I've talked about this guy already, Mel, but I have to bring him back for more. Marshawn Nealon, my guy, the edge from Western Michigan, who of course, of course played for multiple seasons with Braden Fiske. But I love everything about Marshawn Nealon's story and also the player that he is. He's a Grand Rapids kid, Mel. He ends up staying home, plays at Western Michigan, plays for the past four seasons there, briefly entered the transfer portal and actually committed to Deion Sanders in Colorado this past year and then decides to stay home. He has just 13 career sacks, Mel, but I don't think that's a Marshawn Nealon problem. I think it's probably a reminder that basically other than Braden Fiske, Braden Fisk, there was nobody that teams feared on this Western Michigan defense. And they just basically said, if we can block 99, we'll do exactly that. The hands are so heavy. The power is so unique here for Marshawn Nealon. And the way in which they utilized him this past season, when Fisk was down playing at Florida State, and it was just the Marshawn Nealon show, was so unique. I've talked about that Syracuse game that I watched this past season as my first exposure to Nealon from the 2023 year. One of the most impressive games for any player in all of college football that goes way beyond the box score, Mel. They were blitzing Marsha Nealon. It was like a stand-up inside linebacker. They basically said, hey, you're our best athlete. You're our best player. Whatever it takes for us to wreak havoc with you, we're going to do it. I think he's entered into the third-round conversation, Mel, and in a class that is not deep with edges. If you told me he went a little bit higher than that, I wouldn't be totally surprised. Yeah, I think the Mid-American Conference field, you mentioned Western, but how about Eastern Michigan with Max Crosby not that long ago? Uh, yeah. He dropped further than you thought, considering his production in the Mid-American Conference. He was like a fourth-round draft choice. Max Crosby should have been a top-ten pick in the first round, right? Well, Marshawn Nealon shows that type of natural pass rush ability and the length. Talk about a guy, if he gets into the third round, Come on. You can get after the quarterback like he's shown. There's no doubt about it. We've seen it happen before where guys that can get after the quarterback, whether it is because he's in the Mid-American Conference, whatever it may be, how did Max Crosby get into the fourth round? Well, Marshawn Nealon, we'll see where he comes off the board. I'm with you. He was my fifth highest rated defensive end right now. All right, look at that. I try to give you guys a sleeper that deserves some more attention. Mel's had him as one of his top five edges since, like, August. I'm telling you, one of these days I want to find a player that Mel is not totally smitten by or knows his entire backstory. That'll be another day. Let's go to one more player, Mel. And for an LSU defense that was not very good this year, they did have some pretty good individual pieces, including a massive man in the middle. Yeah, Mason Smith is an intriguing guy, Field, for this reason. He was an elite recruit, right? He showed in practice. He could dominate. They were raving about him coming into the season a couple years ago. Then the first game, the ACL injury. This year, the suspension early, then a little banged up. In the last three games of this past season, he was getting after the quarterback the explosiveness, right? Everything we saw, the quickness when he was healthy was coming to the light. It was coming to the forefront late in the year. The production, the consistency wasn't there. Why? Because he was hurt, then banged up. And when he was out there playing through it and trying to get back to full strength and getting back to where he was pre-ACL, right? He didn't look like the same player. So when he's now a couple years removed coming up from that ACL, watch out. Defensive tackle position we thought would be really strong this year. It has not materialized, right? We thought Mason Smith would be one of those guys. I'm ready to move him back up. I've had him out of the top 10 defensive tackles, but I got to look at what he is when he's healthy, yeah. what he was when he was dominant in practice, what he can be. Coach him up. You get yourself a great player. I'm going to put him in around that 5-6 spot at defensive tackle on my big board. Yeah, 6'6", six 315 six, pounds, Mel. The frame is terrific. I'm with you. It felt like this past season that not all guys recover from ACLs 
on the same timeline. And when you're a bigger body like that, mm -hmm. it's hard to work yourself right back into the same shape that you were in pre-injury. Yep. This feels like kind of one where like you're pulling back from that 2021 season when he looked like he was going to become the next great LSU defensive tackle, right? You think about guys like our colleagues, Booger McFarlane and Marcus Spears, both of course first round picks. Glenn Dorsey, the third overall pick in the draft about a decade ago. LSU has had this track record of great defensive tackles and the way that Mason Smith was being talked about during that 2021 season was big time. He had those three sacks against McNeese State that kind of was the breakout party, but Hasn't been quite the same player over the past two seasons. Hopefully he continues to uh, kind of get back to full shape, or 100% shape, I should say, from that ACL tear that was suffered back in 2022. If so, a chance for him to bounce back and look more like the player we thought he was going to be back in 2021. All right, so there are guys that need a whole lot more attention. We have covered three of them, Mel, but things only get more interesting coming up here on First Draft as we dive into a running back, an edge rusher, and also a cornerback who has one very specific skill that I think gives him a chance to become a real player at the NFL level. More first draft coming up in just a moment. All right, we're back here on first draft. He's Mel Kuyper Jr. I am Field Yates, and we are ripping through some players that we think deserve a little bit more attention, Mel. And I don't know how many guys make the path from Mississippi to the University of Oregon down to Florida State. But Trey Benson, running back from Florida State, took exactly that path. And you and I both acknowledge this is not a great running back class. There won't be a first-round pick at the running back spot. There may not be a second-round pick at the running back spot. But there could be a whole bunch of third- and fourth-round picks at the running back spot. And I think Trey Benson deserves to be in that conversation. Who Benson, after the past, excuse me, after one season of, of really a minimal impact at the University of Oregon, goes to Florida State and has just a monster year the past two seasons, Mel. And there are a lot of things that I like about Trey Benson. I think he's disciplined. I think he has good vision. I think he hits the hole with the right amount of urgency. I don't know if he has true breakaway speed, but he certainly is fast enough in my estimation. And I think most importantly about Trey Benson, Mel, he's a weapon in the passing game. Over 10 yards a catch this past season, so you're not just getting the ability for him to be a first and second down workhorse, which you saw over 300 total carries over the past two seasons, but the chance for him to impact the passing game consistently, and I'm not talking about just little dump ups here or there, Mel, I'm talking about actually utilizing him, running some legitimate routes. That's in play for Trey Benson, one of my favorite backs in this year's class. Might not be RB1, might not be a top three running back, might not be a top 75 pick, but I think he could become, in the right circumstances, a starting level running back in the NFL. What do you think? Yeah, I'm with you. I think this year with Jonathan Brooks' injury late in the season, he would have been clearly a second-round guy coming out of Texas now with the injury. So my number one running back, but running backs two through five are interchangeable, right? You got Marshawn Lloyd coming out of USC. You mentioned Benson, Audra Estime, Notre Dame, and a host of others, really, Field. It goes maybe seven or eight guys for that two through five spot. So that's kind of interchangeable. They're all third to fifth rounders, and running backs historically drop. Why? Because most teams have a stable of running backs all Already. And in this group, there's going to be some that like one guy a little bit more than the other, and it's going to be a lot of mixed opinion. So you know, trying to figure out your top five, top six running backs isn't easy, but Benson's certainly one of those guys. And one trivia question that you could probably win a bar bet with, Mel. Trey Benson was the first player in the history of Doak Campbell Stadium to return the opening kickoff of a game for a touchdown. It had not happened in 73 years prior to his opening wow. kickoff touchdown. I, I would have never guessed that was the case. And yet, Trey Benson is the answer to a very fun trivia question. All right, you found a guy that I think is one of the most ultimate upside guys in the entire draft mill. I don't know how many players with one college start, one college start, end up being a possible top 100 pick, but you may have found yourself one. Who is it? Well, Austin Booker, Field, when you think about a pass rusher off the edge coming out of Kansas, formerly of Minnesota, and he didn't do much at Minnesota, right? Think about it, Kansas, and a guy who has length, and I love the fact that he showed a little bend at times at 6'4", and half, 240 pounds. What do I love more than anything? I love length, long arms, being able to utilize that ability to basically deflect passes away, become a factor. Don't let that offensive tackle get into your body. The way he disengages against the run, he seals the edge there. He's still getting better. He's just scratched the surface of what he can be in the National Football League. 
talking about Big 12 defensive newcomer of the year. The Texas game and the Kansas State game this year stood out for me field for Austin Booker and you like a guy who did virtually nothing until he got to Kansas and then he kind of explodes onto the national scene when you're his height and you are able to add some weight and you played up and down at Kansas and they're very effective and he had stick out performances in a couple games where he was popping and you saw as I say just a little bend he's going to keep getting better in that regard once he's coached up he's got that secondary move a little bit going already he's going to keep getting better there Austin Booker a guy that could be a little overlooked early because he was a kind of a one-year wonder uh, you'd like to see another year at the collegiate level to build on that, but he didn't have it. So maybe he drops down just a little bit further than he really should. Really like Austin Booker in that third, fourth round area. Yeah, Mel, one of the things that's really hard that I'm finding about this job, job as, a, as a draft analyst is like when it gets to this portion of the draft, there might be teams that are saying to themselves, hey, this kid's too good to pass up at the end of the third round, right? Because you mentioned mm -hmm. the length. The production from this past year was really good. I mean, 40 solo tackles, eight sacks, two forced fumbles, and is really only season playing a legitimate role in college football. He's a redshirt sophomore, so the book is still yet to be fully written on Austin Booker. Other teams might say, hey, you know what? Too much of a projection for us. We feel like there are some other guys that have shown us enough on tape to feel like they are safe or bets. I'm realizing that like finding a place for this guy can be a tricky thing to do, but the upside is really difficult to ignore. I know talking to people at Kansas, Mel, they feel like he is, as you said, just scratching the surface. Like, if you think this guy has reached his maximum potential, the joke is on you, my friends. He might need a full redshirt year, right? Because he has played so little football, even at the college football level. But if he hits that, like, top percentile outcome, Austin Booker can become one of the best pure pass rushers from a class that is not exactly stock full of them. I'll give you one more here, Mel. We can talk about a million different guys, but one for this segment at least. You know, the NFL, uh, we are seeing a lot of players that are drafted with either five or six years of college experience because of the fact that there was the COVID year. Here's a six-year guy. A six-year guy who probably needed years five and six because that was when he broke out. Elijah Jones, cornerback from Boston College. And Mel, when I think about players on day three, which is where I think Elijah Jones probably ends up, I'm often looking for a guy that has a signature trait. And there are a lot of corners in college football that we'll talk about that are going to go maybe in the first round that have minimal on-ball production because teams don't bother tempting them, right? I mean, a guy like Ennis Rakestraw has one career interception. One. He might be a first-round pick from Missouri. But Elijah Jones was tested a whole bunch over the past two years, Mel, and he met the occasion very frequently as well. He had 22 total pass breakups and seven interceptions over the past two seasons, including five picks this past year en route to all ACC honors. When teams tested him, he usually made them regret that test. Not perfect. Size isn't off the charts. We'll see about the speed here, Mel. But a guy who... If pressed into a third or fourth cornerback role fairly early on in his career, I think has the confidence in man coverage to hold up pretty capably because of that signature trait of being this ball hawk that when the ball is in his vicinity, he feels like it's more his than it is the wide receiver's. Yeah, I think the development of Elijah Jones, the ability to keep getting better and better field. He had been there. He didn't really notice <coughs> him. He had started some games. He fell back. Then the last two years, he was really playing at a high level. The ball skills, the ability to create turnovers when the opportunity presents itself. It's not frustrating with him. When he gets an opportunity, he will get you the turnover. Some guys can't. He did. You mentioned the seven picks and all those past breakups. Track star in high school, right? Yep. So he's got some speed as well as recovery ability there. Think about it. He's a willing tackler. You can't play with 10 guys in terms of tackling. You got to have 11 guys that are out there to get to the ball and bring that guy to the ground. He will do that. To me, he kept getting better and better. And that's what staying in college for not just a couple years benefits a player like Elijah Jones. He stuck it out. And over the last two years, he was really good. Just as an aside here, Mel, obviously we've talked about the potential for four or five corners going in the first round. Do you feel like the depth of this class is perhaps being a bit overlooked? Because what I'm finding, Mel, is that while there might be like a run at the start of the draft, maybe a little bit of a gap from like the end of round one and early round two to maybe like the middle of round three and then round four, it feels like that group in round three and four could be fairly significant. A lot of guys that I like. Yeah, 
he's one of those guys, feel I think we're going to get to another guy that kind of falls into that same category. But certainly with Elijah Jones, I think when you look at length, and I, I always say, people say, what are you looking more forward to than anything at the combine field? Arm length is so critical. Mm. And I think when you get a guy 6'1 and a half, 180 to 185 pounds, you talked this about the Seattle Seahawks, right? The Pete Carroll days. What did they always want? John Schneider, the GM, still there as the GM with Mike McDonald, the new head coach, right? They want length. You see it with their corners. And what that allows you to do is be able to create a play that normally would have been for the other team, going the other way for a touchdown. Just that little fingertip, that deflection that you create because of length and longer arms than the other guy. Short arm corners, no. Longer arm corners with length. I think a lot of teams focus on that. If you have a certain number or below that number, they're going to say no. He's, he's not our kind of guy. So length to me at a variety of spots, particularly cornerback, very important. Yeah, certainly very important. Uh, Elijah Jones was down there at the Senior Bowl as well. Looked like he certainly fit in amongst those players. And the last thing I'll say about him, Mel, is that while the ACC wasn't like dominant, dominant in terms of top and wide receivers, there were some games and some reps against the Keon Coleman's of the world where Elijah Jones said, yeah, I want the matchup here. I am certainly capable of giving my best to your best and our team faring okay. Uh, he, of course, departing from the program that now is being led by Bill O'Brien up there in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts. Right, we are coming back with more players that deserve a whole bunch more love. And a reminder, these are not just guys who are going to go in day three. There might be a couple of guys that could go as high as the second round. Mel and I will dive into that on the other side of this break. More first draft rolls along in just a couple of moments. All right, back here on first draft, he's Mel Kuyper Jr., of course. Now I'm Field Yates, and Mel, we're going to continue to dive into some players that we think deserve a little more shine. And I'll start up here because I've got a wide receiver that okay. I know this guy's not going to last that long, right? This guy might be a top 45, 50 pick. Wouldn't surprise me if he is. And yet, as we discussed earlier on in the show, all these great wide receivers in this class invariably means that there are certain players that just aren't going to be talked about enough. And maybe when you have perhaps the second best wide receiver in the draft as your teammate. This is just the natural byproduct. But Jalen Polk from Washington, you have my attention now. He began his career at Texas Tech. Man, does it feel like there are a lot of great players that started their career at Texas Tech. He transferred. He actually went to the same high school, by the way, as Des Bryant, Kiki QT, the former Colts wide receiver. And at 6'2", 204 pounds, you like the size. He had seven games with 100-plus receiving yards this season. He had 122 yards in the game against Texas in the semifinals. Had a monster game, including an opening drive play that kind of set the, town, the tone for how that game was going to be played offensively. And more than anything else, Mel, we're going back here to signature traits. I think Jalen Polk might have some of, if not the strongest, hands of any wide receiver in the entire draft. That's how good I think his hands are and can be at the NFL level. I think it's important to define like how you evaluate hands as well. I'm not just talking about miracle catches like the Odell Beckham Jr. catch from about a decade ago or the Justin Jefferson catch against the Bills a season ago up there in Buffalo. I'm talking about a guy who just consistently claws the football. He's got vice grips for hands. And I think Jalen Polk fits that mold. Obviously, Michael Penix Jr., very strong arm, was unafraid to jam the football into tight windows that only quarterbacks like him were capable of. And I thought that Jalen Polk's ability to snatch catches in contested catch situations, Mel, really was a signature trait for him that bodes well to the NFL level, added some verticality as well to his game, like Jalen Polk a lot. Yeah, I think the consistency year in and year out, you talk about what he did for two years with Michael Penix Jr. You think about the 17-yard average per catch, obviously receptions up. Jalen McMillan wasn't the fact. Remember, he got injured early on, then he came on late. So Polk and Odunze were the key guys with Jack Westover, an underrated H-back on that football team. Devin Culp as well. I like Westover as one of those guys we could throw into this discussion as a guy is going to be uh, slipping through the cracks a bit. Could be a heck of a player for somebody, a contributor in the National Football League. But Polk, the fact that he attacks the football and he was a guy when McMillan was not able to get it done at the highest level coming off the injury. He stepped it up with Odunze, then McMillan comes back, and then you got the three guys, right, the triplets again, getting it done at a high level. So I'm with you. When you talk about the top ten receivers field, 
And you say, okay, Troy Franklin, Oregon, Malachi Corley from Western Kentucky, right? And you got Tez Walker from North Carolina, Jalen Polk, Washington, trying to figure out Lad McConkey from Georgia. That 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th wide receiver spot, it's a lot of those names in that mix that will mean second round possibility or at worst the third round. And by the way, nobody in the league is going to see them identically, right? Everybody's going to have their own version of like, wide receivers five through 12, that's gonna be very different from the next evaluator that you speak to. It's just the nature of having a lot of great players at the same position in one draft. All right, I'll start another one here, Mel, and then I'll leave it to you. But uh, I bet if you asked Max Melton, cornerback from Rutgers, who the best corner in this year's draft class is, he would say himself. You know why? Because he plays with that kind of confidence. Started 40 out of 43 games at Rutgers. And when Rutgers played against the biggest competition, Max Melton wanted all the smoke. Lined up opposite of Marvin Harrison Jr. Did a great job. Roman Wilson of Michigan, same deal. Probably the two best draft-eligible receivers in this past year's Big Ten. Risky. Has excellent ball skill. And you know why that's no surprise whatsoever, Mel? His older brother is a wide receiver in the NFL that was drafted a few years ago by the Seahawks in the seventh round, who now plays with the Green Bay Packers. That's Bo Melt, who had a nice season for Green Bay. So I like the confidence. Size is good enough. I think he's feisty. I think he's got that, that sort of air about him, Mel, that is important to corner. You might get burnt one play, but you don't have time to fret over that. So I thought that the resolve was impressive for Max Melton. Could play some inside and outside corner, too. Yeah. Yeah, Phil, we all talked to our friends in the National Football League. I'll tell you a quick story. I'm talking two years ago, and they said, how about corners and where they're going to go? And Max Melton's name was in that mix. Had he come out early, didn't, and it goes back to Rutgers. So I don't know where Max Melton was already on the radar. NFL people were looking at him as a guy. Could be a little higher picked than, than you thought. Eight interceptions. You, know, you mentioned ball skills. and getting to Eight interceptions over the last three years. 13 pass breakups over the last three years. Bo Melton, one of those young receivers at Green Bay, getting it done. But Max Melton has been on the NFL radar for a while. And we talk about Greg Schiano and the coaching staff and the guys getting ready to be in the NFL. And from a technique standpoint, fundamental standpoint, this kid's ready. Uh, Max Melton, like I said, you get into day three uh, with his kind of length and the way he produced in terms of getting turnovers, like I said, eight picks, he would certainly make sense when we get into that early portion of day three. Yeah, man, I can't wait to see where he uh, lands in the draft again I wouldn't be surprised Mel right in some of these spots where there's just not tremendous depth you don't know like if he got pushed up into the end of day two wouldn't totally surprise me because I think that early run of corners is going to be early and it's going to be often but there's kind of that gap and at some point teams are going to say we got to find ways to cover the players that catch passes from Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen and Joe Burrow and Lamar Jackson. How are we going to do that without great corners? I'll offer one more, and then we'll go back to sort of our back-and-forth mix here, Mel. Matthew Gonsalves, offensive lineman from the University of Pittsburgh. 24 of 38 career games started in Mel. I like the fact that he's played a lot of games on the left side, a lot of games on the right side. 11 games started at right tackle, 13 games started at left tackle. Had a bummer injury this past year. He got hurt in the team's third game. It's a toe injury that cost him the rest of his season. His final season at Pitt, he was a team captain. He was a preseason all-ACC pick. He's got good size, Mel. And when you're looking for that next tier of offensive tackles, the first thing that I'm always going to be looking for, first two things I should say, is one, positional versatility. Because if you're not a guaranteed first-round pick, also probably not a guaranteed first day starter. I need to know, can I rely on you at left tackle, right tackle in a pinch? The answer is yes with Gonsalves. And also the foot quickness, Mel. I need to know if this guy's an athlete because as you and I both know, these defensive ends are growing more ridiculously athletic by this season. We were just talking about Austin Booker. 20 years ago, Austin Booker might've been the best defensive end in the entire draft just based off of pure athletic ability. I thought his footwork stood out to me. Obviously, some questions to answer because of the injury from this past season. From what I've been told, though, everything is on track, making significant progress here, Mel, and a potential swing tackle right away.
That's the main thing, Field. Now, I think I look at Pitt, and I go back to my Jimbo Covert days, scouting yeah. the Pitt Panthers, goes to the Chicago Bears, and, and it's something about the Pitt Panthers, the offensive line, and certainly a guy that can play multiple positions at tackle, and that's critical because, you see, with the Baltimore Ravens, they had some injuries. you got a swing man there with McCarry. you got to look at what Kansas City. they got a couple tackles. You lose Tooney, the offensive guard. Guys that have that ability to swing between right and left tackle are going to be critical in the NFL. When you get into day three, again, coming off an injury, but showed when he was at full strength he could get it done at multiple spots in the era of free agency and injuries in the NFL there's no doubt about it as a key backup that can play both spots and, and, and get you through a period of time while your starters are down and fill in and do a, a, a capable job of keeping himself maintaining that frame between the defensive end and the quarterback he's proven he can do that you know Mel I'm glad you brought up like the idea that like maybe this guy is a backup to start maybe that's where he spends a lot of his career this is not specific to Matthew in this case but Think about the players in the NFL now, Mel, that are incredibly valuable by being just basically backups, the sixth man in along the offensive line. I get it. It's fun when we talk about guys that get taken in the third or fourth round that are going to become longtime starters in the NFL. You want to find as many of those as you possibly can, Mel. But I think about the champs. That's what we always do. Like, Wanye Morris was a swing tackle for them as a rookie. And that kind of stuff matters when Donovan Smith, who we'll see whether he's retained or not for 2024 yep. and beyond. But Morris gave them valuable snaps, filling in as needed. The draft is not merely about finding guys that are just going to be day one starters. 22 out of 53 players are starters on your football team. If you're not good from 23 to about 45 or 46, I'm just telling you, you're either not playing in January or you're not playing deep into January, as we have seen time and again in the NFL. Let's go out way west, Mel. And he wasn't available because of injury during the Senior Bowl week, but I know you and I shared admiration for Brennan Jackson from Washington State. What can you tell me about him? Brennan Jackson has shown he had Ron Stone on the other side, but what Brennan Jackson has shown is he can get after the quarterback. And I think when you look at the last four games of this past season, he was on fire. First eight games, three and a half sacks was okay. He was getting tackles, okay? He was around the ball. But last four games, he had five sacks. Of course, Ron Stone on the other side. We talked about they got a corner. Smith Wade's going to be in the National Football League. Love their safety. Jaden Hicks. There's going to be four or five players field off this defense. They're going to be playing in the National Football League. And Brennan Jackson in a rotation. As a guy who has shown he can get after the quarterback, he hustles, gets those coverage sacks. You see the production there with the eight and a half sacks. As I said, five of those over the last four games of the season. I think Brennan Jackson's the other guy. You get into the fifth, sixth round of this draft. That's when he becomes an attractive possibility. Loved a lot of things that I saw about him, even though he wasn't playing during the week in Mobile Mill. He was there. He showed up. He didn't have to show up, right? The guy couldn't play during the week. He showed up. He was involved with every single drill. And that's in line with the person that he was during his time at Wazoo. This guy played a million miles an hour. You never had to question the effort, the dedication. He was a six-year player, a four-year starter for the Cougars. Beyond that, Mel, he was the uh, one of the semifinalists for the uh, William Campbell Award, which is basically the academic Heisman back in 2022. So you know that you're going to get the very best from Brennan Jackson every single Sunday when that kid is on the field. The length stood out to me. The explosiveness stood out to me a fan of his as well as a day three pick. I'm going to keep the Jackson train rolling here, Mel. Very different style of player, very different stature of player, but I know you and I also love a guy named Jaquan Jackson, wide receiver from Tulane. What do we need to know? I'll tell you what, Michael Pratt and the Tulane Green Wave and what he was able to do there. He talked about being a guy who can get the ball in his hands. We watch him here. is an explosive football player, and he's a confident kid as well. He's got the ability. We're talking about athleticism and quickness and the ability with Michael Pratt to be a key guy playing and playing. You talk about game in, game out. This guy showed up, and I think you're talking about a guy fourth, fifth receiver. Field. Not a guy who's going to be your one, two, maybe not a three, but a fourth, fifth option on an NFL team. Jaquan Jackson has shown he can get it done. Consistency catching the football, big playability, ability after the catch to make things happen. You see the average per catch the last couple of years, right around that 17 yard mark. This is a kid, I think, made Michael Pratt. To me, Michael Pratt's going to be a day three guy, maybe a late round pick, who I think, I'm not saying he's going to be Brock Purdy, but he could maybe be a guy who plays a little better because he doesn't have the wow traits. Jackson certainly helped out Michael Pratt a lot over the last couple of years. You know, you're the king of all these phrases and these sayings, Mel, so I, I don't know if this is one that you've already used before, but Jaquan Jackson is a slot 
Dynamo. This guy in the slot is just an absolute pain in the rear to try to cover. He is going to break ankles left and right, but unlike most slot receivers, has a lot of big play upside that you just referenced. He averaged at least 16.8 yards per reception over the last three seasons of his career. He averaged over 10 yards per punt return in his career. He had 37 kickoff returns in his career. If you're drafting Jaquan Jackson, it feels to me like, Mel, the responsibility is you got to be drafting him with the vision of him being punt return man, potential kick return man, potential slot receiver, potentially getting some carries out of the backfield. You must manufacture touches for Jaquan Jackson left and right. The size, as you mentioned, might be a little bit of a limitation. I don't know if he's going to be a wow player in the red zone. Maybe he's not going to be able to hold up against some of the more physical corners in the NFL, but a really, really fun guy to watch who Michael Pratt was the heartbeat of that Tulane program, obviously, for the past five years. But Jaquan Jackson, one of the best players in that entire program as well. All right, a couple more here, Mel. Uh, and I'll let you start on one of them, and then i got to go with my deep cut. A guy that you and I have been talking about for long long time here and you're excited i'm excited about it as well but uh, michael barrett linebacker from michigan i know a player that i liked a lot but before i talk any thoughts on barrett from you this guy showed up i mean that's the bottom line i come an overachiever a guy that was around the football he bet jim harbaugh got it was kind of a staple you knew every week he would be a guy can be a leader He's rock solid, heck of a collegiate player as a backup in the NFL, special teamer, a guy you put out there and he's going to be a warrior on the field. He's a guy very instinctive field. I think a backup type special teamer, another one of those day three guys that will be a vital part of your roster. That depth that you need, the ability to fill in and not hurt you when he's out there if he has to fill in for an injury and be a guy early on makes his mark on special teams. Michael Barrett can be that kind of guy. I'm not going to do a seven-round mock draft, Mel, but I will give you guys a little preview into if I ever, if I ever did a fifth-round mock draft. Whatever pick the Chargers have in the fifth round, it'll be Michael Barrett, right? I mean, obviously, with the, the ties there to Jim Harbaugh, the winningest player in Michigan history, you know how much winning means to Jim Harbaugh. No player in Michigan history was on the field for more wins than Michael Barrett. He was a six-year player at Michigan, was a starter for three-plus years, he actually started in a spot they called the Viper position back in the day for Michigan. It was what Jabril Peppers kind of made famous during his time uh, with the Wolverines. But over the past two seasons, took over as a starting inside linebacker, played alongside Junior Colson. I like the mentality of Michael Barrett, probably more than I like the physical traits, right? He's only six foot, 239 pounds, Mel. But what I loved about him is that, you know what? He was unafraid in a league in which every team evaluates linebackers a little bit differently. For those that want linebackers that play downhill and love to initiate contact and want to take on blockers and do the dirty work so that teammates can clean up what they have started, I think Michael Barrett kind of fits the mold. You're right, probably hard to draft a guy any higher than the fifth round or so with kind of the profile that Michael Barrett brings to the table. But I do know that if he is there at some point in the fifth or sixth round and the Chargers don't take him, I will be stunned. That just... My, my, my completely meaningless February 19th prediction for April 27th, Mel. I'm here for it. What do you think? I'm with you, Phil. I think being protected by the defensive tackles is very important in Michigan. Freeing up those linebackers like Michael Barrett, an overachiever to flow to the football and rack up all those tackles. And Junior Colson, to me, the linebacker you mentioned, the teammate of Michael Barrett, Junior Colson, to me, is a second, third-round guy. Uh, he can do it all. So Junior Colson, one of those guys that is going to go before Michael Barrett. Obviously, Barrett gets into day three of the draft. But I've waited long enough, Field. You've been, we've been teasing this for about three weeks now. Yep. A guy that you were on from day one. Oh, no, I wasn't. Before you were we on. even got, I think, I, I, you, no, 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 but you were on him. This is your guy. When we talk about, we get into day three of the draft, Rob Adamski, our producer, always says, okay, who are your guys? Yeah. And when you have a list of maybe 25, 30 names, and when they're picked, we're handling the highlights, right? We're giving the analysis, and you guys can all chime in, but these are our guys. Yeah. LDR is your guy. He's not I'm, my guy. I'm not no. touching this no, anymore. No, no. He's Field Yates' guy. Look at this. People, they need to know something right now. Mel Kuyper Jr. is the best teammate you'll ever meet. Here's the backstory. I'm um, sitting at home maybe if, probably about a month or so ago, and I, I catch a little wind. A little birdie says to me, you got to watch this kid, Levi Drake Ramirez, 
defensive lineman from Texas A&M Commerce. Commerce. He just blew up the, the hula bowl. You got to check him out. I'm thinking to myself, all right, let's go do it. I go watch him. And by the way, one season at Texas A&M Commerce. So I had to go back to the tape mail from Southwestern Assemblies of the God University, where he played for four years. It turns out that's a school near Dallas, Texas. And I'm thinking to myself, I finally found a guy the mail probably hasn't studied. And I go find, and I like what I see from LDR, and I reach out to Mel and I say, Mel, I got a guy for you. Check him out. Levi Drake Ramirez. There's no way you've heard of this guy, right? Mel responds, I don't know, 15 minutes later, and has a whole bio on him. He knows everything about LDR, so I can't take credit for him. Mel's been watching this guy since last summer when he wasn't even on the field yet for Texas A&M Commerce. So while Mel will try to make him or allow him to be my guy, I will gladly take it because I do like the player. I just want America to know that for all the things that Mel has done at the highest of levels for 46 years, the passion and the preparation will never cease to amaze me. That's why I love doing this show with you, Mel. And LDR is a player that you and I both on day three, we'll have our moment to talk about him if he is drafted. And I don't like to compare guys to all pros, Mel. But if you told me that you were looking for dollar store version, Walmart version, Avita Vea, I think LDR was trying to become that, right? We don't have tape to roll on this guy who plays such a small school. But he wears number 50. He's got the big, long, flowing hair. He doesn't wear gloves. No wristbands. He's just got those bare sleeves like Vita Vea. And at that level, which is not the NFL, but at that level, he pushed dudes around like Vita Vea does NFL offensive guards. So I get it. He's a big project. He's probably at best a seventh-round pick, Mel. But if somebody was down at the Senior Bowl and was looking for a disruptive player that looked like he fit in, Levi Drake Rodriguez was part of the crew that fit in. I hope we have a moment together on day three. What do you think about him? I hope we do feel I know Matt Miller will be sitting there and Lewis Riddick and we'll be having some fun with this. And this is the great opportunity for players like this to get that chance. And we used to have, I was back in the day field with 17 rounds. Then I was back oh. in the day when it went to 12 rounds, right? 17. And now we're seven rounds. So, uh, you know, L yeah, LDR would be certainly a draft choice, and some really good ones run yeah. from the 8th through the 17th round over the last X amount of years, right? I've been doing it 46 years. But the bottom line is, this kid, does he sneak into the draft? Maybe if he doesn't, he becomes a priority free agent. Certainly showed enough one tape for, to get your attention, my attention, and certainly I'm sure he's gotten the NFL's attention. You know what, Mel? Th this actually brings me to a YouTube question that was submitted by Only Morale, and I just... It's the perfect pivot to this question, Mel, and uh, uh, pardon me for a second as I read it off my phone. Only Morale asked sure. this, who does all this scouting? For real, though, does Mel Kuyper Jr. really watch all these college game? What if some of these players are on a bad team? Are they draft worthy? Mel, the answer is, you do all this scouting. You watch all these games. You're taping games left and right. It is a labor of love, my friend. Yeah, back in the day, in the late 70s, well, I had the big, huge satellite dish on the roof at Ramblewood Road in Baltimore, Maryland. And people say, what? Or they'd come down the street field and say, what is that up on that roof of that house? We had the corner of our house, right? Uh, with the fireplace, had it all going. But up on that roof was a huge satellite dish. <laughs> well, nobody had it back in there. Wasn't a little. This was a, this was a massive satellite dish on the roof of the house. We get everybody coming by. What the heck is, what's going on here? And I'm in there watching. I was able to get some NFL. I was able to get all these cops. I'm getting everything back in the day field. So, yeah, and, and then get, obviously tape sent to you from schools. But the, the huge satellite dish back in the day was a tremendous benefit to me trying to evaluate these players. Uh, it, it sure was then, and it sure still is now. And, again, the process. I'm not trying to sound like I'm just being a mensch here. But uh, Mel is more prepared and more dutiful with his responsibilities than anybody else that I've ever met in any line of work. We're going to wrap up first draft here in just a moment. We'll be right back with a few final thoughts on players that you need to know. All right, wrapping up here on first draft, he is Mel Kuyper Jr. and I am Field Yates. We have given you now about 10 guys that we think deserve a bit more shine. Mel, as we say goodbye here, I'd be curious, is there a player that comes to mind that you feel proud of? Maybe not the best ever, but one recently that you say to yourself, I thought this guy had a chance to be a real NFL player. He slid through the cracks to day three, and you felt vindicated once he got on the field in the NFL. That's a tough call, Field, because when we – I don't want to do revisionist history, but I remember when Tom Brady was picked. Uh, and you I were great on it. And I remember what I said about Tom – 
And, and I just go back to Tom Brady, and I, I bring it up because there was a player from Southwest Texas State and a player from Hofstra who went quarterbacks, okay? Remember Giovanni Carmazzi and Spurgeon Wind. So when we're talking about it, it kind of ties in. Not to say, oh, pound your chest because you had a, uh, an evaluation of Tom Brady. Did I think he was going to be the greatest of all time? No. I didn't know that was going to happen. But it just ties into how guys, as we said, slip through the cracks yeah. and guys maybe even from a smaller school and a lesser program in terms of going up against elite talent go ahead of a guy from Michigan right. you highlighted Michael Barrett right a guy from Southwest Texas State and Hofstra went ahead of the great Tom Brady greatest of all time that's why the draft is in exact science that's why we have so much fun doing this and guess what we can evaluate 20 hours a day and we're all going to make mistakes that's the why we love this process hey Mel by the way Go find your favorite GM in the entire NFL. I don't care if it's the GM of the best team or the worst team. They also have players that they wish they could have evaluated better or draft picks that they did not make. All right, great stuff here. Players that you need to know more about. Be sure to check out all episodes of First Draft on YouTube. Just search First Draft or wherever you get your podcasts. We are coming back on Thursday with much more. He is Mel Kuyper Jr., the incomparable Mel Kuyper Jr., who knew just a little bit about Tom Brady way back in the day in 2000. I'm Phil Yates. We'll talk to you guys again in the next version here of First Draft.